January 15th, 1878. A bitterly cold winter evening. A train slowly departs from the Terrafil station. On board are 200 jubilant passengers returning from a religious revival meeting in Hartford. What happens to the train in the next few minutes is one of the greatest unsolved mysteries in the history of Simsbury. As the two engines pulling the train cross the bridge over the Farmington River, something suddenly goes wrong. With a sickening groan, the train plunges into the icy river below. How could such a calamity occur? What exactly happened on that bridge that fateful night? There are three theories to how this disaster could have happened. The train derailed, the bridge collapsed, or someone tampered with it. Earlier in the day, the very same train left Millerton, New York and headed east toward Hartford. This was a special 10-car train pulled by two engines, the Salisbury and the Terrafil. As the train rolled through the beautiful winter landscape of western Connecticut, it stopped at each station to pick up passengers. Everyone was in good spirits. After all, they were on their way to see Dwight Lyman Moody. Moody was an evangelist who had become an international celebrity. His recent appearance in London had drawn over 17,000 people. Moody was accompanied by Ira Sankey, whose powerful baritone voice made him the most popular hymnal singer of the time. At 9.17 p.m., the train eased its way out of Hartford for the return trip west to Millerton. The train made a brief stop at Bloomfield and another at Terrafil. In Terrafil, both engines took on water for steam. They were now only a half mile from the bridge. By all accounts, the mood on the train was festive. Shall we gather at the I was in the baggage car and went into the first passenger car to see how the people were getting along and found them singing Moody and Sankey hymns. In the first seats were six school teachers from New Hartford and Pine Meadow, and they were perfectly happy, singing, Yes, we'll gather at the river. Thomas Elmo. Sometime after 10 p.m., the first engine, the Salisbury, began to cross the bridge. The bridge, like most others of the time, was constructed of wooden timbers and iron suspension rods. The bridge was relatively new, having been built by the A.D. Briggs Company of Springfield only seven years earlier. After passing the first span, the engineer of the lead engine, George Hatch, felt his engine lurch and begin to fall towards the frozen river below. The force of the train hurled the engine off the bridge, half bearing it upside down in the ground. The second engine, a baggage car, and three passenger cars followed. The back half of the third car rested precariously on the remaining section of the bridge. None of the other coaches left the track. I cannot tell you exactly how the thing happened. We were running along smoothly when suddenly I was thrown violently forward. There was a great crash and the lights were extinguished. Reverend Robert Hunt. I first heard a cracking and then felt a continual jar as if the engine had left the track and was bounding along over the ties. This continued for a short time and then down we went. James McDermott. A number of passengers were in the baggage car at the time of the accident. One of those was John Jones, the superintendent of the railroad. 
who was sorting tickets. I found myself in the water at the first shock and unable to extricate myself, but soon after came another shock which released me. The horrible danger caused by the hot seam from the engine became apparent. Engineer Hatch of the second engine was pinned in his cab. The whistle was broken and sent out a stream of steam which scalded him so badly that he died. Thomas Elmore. The screams of the wounded and the dying quickly brought help. Soon church bells across Terrafil summoned rescuers and onlookers to the scene. For those trapped in the wreckage, the terror was unimaginable. I was hit on the head by a timber of the bridge which came through and got a bad cut. It was very dark so that I could see nothing except the streak of light which came through the hole in the roof. Meanwhile, the water was coming into the car and rapidly rising. Thomas Elmore Escaping the cars did not necessarily mean the horror was over. In getting out, I saw something black, about as large as my hand. I took hold of it and found it was a body. I lifted the head and body out of the water. I think it was the woman from Canaan. She was dead, and I left her on the ice, partly out of the water. Samuel R. Johnson The stories of survival and heroism are remarkable. Reverend Goodnow of Winstead made it out by climbing through the roof of the train. Despite suffering two broken limbs, he still had enough strength to return to the wreck and save drowning passengers. S.C. Beckley of Canaan found a woman pinned in a car and unable to get out. He supported her head till help came and kept her from drowning. Another survivor, E.R. Carter from New Hartford, searched all night for passengers in the freezing cold. The cries were heartrending of men and women, many of whom appeared to be suffering from extreme pain. Some were crying piteously, Oh, don't step on me! Get off, for my legs are broken! Help us! And all such cries and appeals. We assisted several ladies out and got one young man who was up to his neck in water. After doing this, I was so thoroughly chilled through that I became numb and had to give up. Thomas Elmo. For those who lived through the Civil War, the area surrounding the wreck resembled a battlefield. There were injured everywhere. The kind people of Terreville opened their doors to the wounded, providing dry clothes and comfort when possible. John Jones, who had escaped from the wreck, ran the half mile back to the Terrafil station, his clothes soaking wet. Upon arriving at the station, he was surprised to see the telegraph officer still on duty at this late hour. Jones ordered him to send a telegram to Hartford requesting an emergency train with medical supplies. Dr. D.P. Pelletier received the telegram in Hartford. He knew he needed to alert more doctors, and alert them fast. Pelletier ran to the Capitol Avenue drugstore to make what the Hartford Current would claim was the world's first emergency phone call, the telephone being a brand new invention at the time. Soon, 21 doctors were boarding a train in Hartford bound for the accident. As the sun rose the following morning, steam still seeped from the wrecked engines. Someone remarked of the engines that they died hard. The grisly task of recovering the dead was now underway. Shortly after 9 o'clock a.m., commotion could be heard from a group of workers who were chopping through the ice. They had found a body. In a few moments, the stiffened body of a young man was laid tenderly upon a sled and pulled to shore. The remains were immediately identified as those of George Penny of New Hartford, age 18. He was one of six friends who had been playing on the platform between the first passenger car and the baggage car when the crash occurred. A 
Upon seeing the body, an acquaintance of Penny's sobbed, the others will be found in the same place. Sadly, he was correct. The day of the accident, these six young friends from New Hartford cheerfully boarded the train. By the end of the night, five of them were dead. Two of the deceased were brothers, William and Elias Gilman. The young Benjamin Gilks and Thomas Murray also lost their lives. When the bridge collapsed, breaking the river ice, all five were thrown into the cold water. The river's current dragged them helplessly under the ice and held them there until they were drowned. The return of the bodies to New Hartford created a scene few could forget. Young girls from the village covered the five coffins with rosebuds and violets. Mr. McNary, principal of the school the Gilman brothers attended, caringly watched over the bodies. At two o'clock, the funeral procession deposited Murray's body at the Catholic Church. The others were brought to the Congregational Church. There were no hearses. Each casket was carried to the cemetery by six young men. Among them was young Howard Widmer, the lone survivor of the group. Three young women were also killed, Minnie Allen and the McCarger sisters, Mary and Hattie. The McCargers were both young teachers in Winstead. Mary, the eldest, had been anxiously counting down the days to her wedding. The Methodist church was draped in mourning on the day of their funeral. Every foot of space, even the aisles, was occupied. Hundreds were unable to gain entrance. It would take over an hour for all in attendance to pass in front of the altar to view to the deceased. Winstead lost another citizen with the death of George Hatch. Hatch was the 42-year-old engineer who was at the controls of the first engine, the Salisbury. Lucius Lewis found the ill-fated man lying by the wreck. He was horribly burned by the steam from the locomotive. Lewis valiantly carried Hatch to the Thurston house in Terrafield to find care. For a time it was thought that he might recover. However, he began to lose strength rapidly. His wife arrived at his bedside at 9 o'clock a.m. By 11 a.m., he had died. Now the best eyewitness to the crash was lost forever. Special trains carried railroad men from across the state to his funeral. Over 500 of Hatch's fellow Masons also attended. The president of the railroad, Caleb Camp, served as a pallbearer. Reverend Forbes, who conducted the services, praised Hatch as a man who never drank liquor or beer, never swore, and was an affectionate father and husband. His casket was a simple one made of black walnut. It was covered with flowers, an anchor, a cross, and a Masonic square and compass. In attendance was Hatch's elderly mother. One can only imagine her thoughts at this time. Her life was filled with tragedy. Two brothers had been murdered, a third had drowned. Her sister's husband was killed in the Civil War, and her own husband had recently and unexpectedly died in front of her. And now this. Following a short Masonic service, Hatch was buried in a quiet little cemetery among the pines. Howard Warner, a 17-year-old ticket agent from Canton, also lost his life that night. Warner's father and brother Wallace had searched for him all morning. Wallace stood over the wrecked car, peering into the water where he felt his brother might be. His father's grief was too deep for words. Shortly after 12, Howard's body was found in the wreckage. His distraught father later took his own life. The two oldest fatalities, Harriet Jones, 59, and Jeanette Warner, 43, were both housekeepers. As the train pitched into the water, the passengers in the car were tossed about. 
Harriet was thrown forward. The force of the jolt was sufficient to break her neck and cause instant death. All told, 13 unfortunate souls perished in the horrific crash. And what was left for the grieving families? What were the families of the deceased, families who had depended on them for a livelihood and companionship left with? The Connecticut Western Railroad Company reimbursed the victim's relatives for $200 to $600, or approximately thirty to 90000 in today's dollars. One of the strangest stories associated with the aftermath of the accident is that of James Sayers. Sayers, an Englishman, was arrested on February 4th and charged with robbing the bodies of the dead passengers. In his possession was jewelry, a violin, pocketbooks, gold-bound spectacles, an overcoat, and a pair of pants all belonging to the victims. Sayers claimed that he saw the wreck and went to investigate. After initially resisting arrest, Sayers confessed, saying he thought he would take what he could get. Since there was no law on the books against robbing a dead body, Sayers was charged with larceny and sentenced to 30 days in jail and a fine of $7. The official panel of inquests was comprised of 12 men from Simsbury. They met for four weeks, interviewing everyone from passengers to civil and mechanical engineers. Samples of iron from the bridge were sent to Colts in Hartford and to Philadelphia to be tested. No cause of the accident was ever agreed upon. Eight of the members placed the blame on the railroad, stating that the bridge was in poor condition. The immediate responsibility for the accident must fall upon the officers of the railroad company, not for running two locomotives over the bridge, but for building such a structure and neglecting to keep it in repair. Mansfield, Maryland. The remaining four members, some of whom were shareholders in the railroad, disagreed saying the first engine derailed on the bridge and therefore it was not the fault of the railroad company. The last and certainly most explosive theory is that someone had tampered with the bridge. The New York Times reported that prior to the accident, the railroad received an anonymous letter threatening vengeance on the company if they did not fire certain workers. The note stated that unless a change was made, something would be heard to drop. Following the accident, there was another ominous note to the railroad asking, Did I not warn you? Haven't you heard something drop? Both letters bore the same handwriting and were postmarked from Plainville. A letter uncovered in the archives of the State Library adds credence to this theory. Written by John Jones, the man in charge of the day-to-day -day operation of the railroad, the letter relates his belief that the accident was an act of sabotage. The derailment was caused by person or persons to me unknown, displacing more or less ties upon the bridge. In testimony for the investigators, another railroad official, John McManus, said, When I ascertained where it occurred, I instantly came to the conclusion that the bridge had been tampered with, and still think so. The belief that the accident was part of a diabolical plot was bolstered by a dream that was widely reported in the papers. Mr. J. L. Bragg of Canaan had expected to go to Hartford that day, but was prevented by a feeling of dread. During the night, he awoke his wife and asked her if she had heard the train go by. She said no. Well, you never will. I just saw in a dream a man go up to the Terrafield Bridge and tamper with it so that it would fall. He then ran away and got out of sight. 
Pretty soon the train came along and plunged through the bridge into the river. It's down there now. I know it is. Bragg was described as a respected businessman of keen intelligence who had no apparent reason for fabricating such a story. The Connecticut Western Railroad Company, owner of the bridge, was able to retrieve and repair the locomotives and quickly rebuilt the bridge to the same design. Even before the accident, the railroad had been facing financial trouble. Now it was unable to pay off its mounting debts. Two years after the accident, the railroad's mortgage was foreclosed, forcing the company into bankruptcy. Thank mm -hmm. you.